For decades, Cunard's QE2 was the epitome of luxury and power, a symbol of British maritime excellence, and for many, a home away from home on the high seas. But today we're delving into a story of an engineering emergency at sea and the ingenuity of the ship's crew. It's a story that proves that even the most robust ocean liners can face a fight against the sea itself. I'm Chris Frame, the Maritime Historian, and this story shows that even a vessel of QE2 stature is not immune to a serious and potentially devastating incident. This video was created with information from the UK Government's Marine Accident Investigation Branch, a report which you can find linked in the description below. On 18 May 2002, the passenger liner Queen Elizabeth II left Southampton with 1,457 passengers and 973 crew on board, on a routine transatlantic crossing to New York. QE2 had sailed this route many times, and for the first few days, the journey was normal. The rhythmic hum of the ship's mighty man BMW engines were a backdrop to the passengers' onboard life. That was until the early hours of the 21st of May, when a senior watchkeeping engineer discovered a serious seawater leak in the ship's aft engine room during his routine inspection rounds. The source of the flooding was quickly identified. It was a perforated 9.8 inch diameter or 250 millimeter seawater inlet pipe. This pipe supplied water to an evaporator that was used for producing fresh water. The leak was serious, made worse as the pipe's failure was located between QE2's outer shell and the isolating valve, which made it impossible to simply close the valve and stop the water from pouring in. The crew were now faced with a literal hole in the hull, with nothing but their wits to stop it. The sheer force of the incoming seawater was immense, and with 2,430 souls on board, time was of the essence. The ship's engineers immediately went to work. First, they tried to fabricate a clamp with a rubber seal to cover the leak. At the same time, they activated the bilge pumping system to remove the incoming water. However, the oily water holding tanks filled up in just two hours. With the water level rising and two main engines shutting down, the crew had no option but to use the emergency bilge injection system to pump the water directly overboard. This was in accordance with the MARPOL anti-pollution regulations, which allow such discharges to occur to ensure the safety of a ship. Over the course of several hours, an estimated 105,669 gallons, or about 400 cubic metres, of water was pumped out of QE2. Despite their best efforts, the initial solution failed. The water inflow was reduced slightly, but the pipe was too fragile to hold a permanent clamp. Fearing a catastrophic failure that could completely detach the valve from the pipe and lead to an uncontrolled flood, the engineers knew they needed a more effective solution, and fast. The consequence of a total failure would have been severe. The rate of water ingress would have exceeded the ship's pumping capacity, leading to the free flooding of the aft engine room and the disabling of the main propulsion motors. This would have left the world's most famous ship dead in the rough Atlantic Ocean. So QE2's engineering crew devised an ingenious solution. They fabricated a device that allowed them to insert a flexible bladder, or inflatable bag, into the leaking pipe. The bladder was actually a spare part of the QE2's watertight door hydraulic system. They attached the bladder to a sliding tube, bolted the device to the valve flange, and pushed the bladder into the pipe. Once in place, they filled it with compressed air, which expanded the bladder and stopped the water flow. This quick thinking and improvisation with onboard resources was an absolute masterclass in marine problem solving. However, the QE2's crew could not rest on their laurels, as the first bladder failed after several hours, but the engineers would not give up. They quickly repeated the process with a longer and more robust bladder, which successfully sealed the leak and remained in place for the rest of the transatlantic crossing. Once the flow of water was stopped, they built a steel box around the failed pipe and welded it in place as a temporary cofferdam. This quick thinking and smart engineering ensured QE2 could safely continue her journey to New York, where permanent repairs were made and she was able to return to regular service. So what caused the pipe to fail in the first place? An investigation by the UK's Marine Accident Investigation Branch found that the failure was due to simple seawater corrosion. However, the construction of the pipe and its flange made it difficult to inspect for corrosion in the first place. The QE2 had had a massive re-engineering refit in the 1980s, where her steam turbine engines were replaced with a diesel-electric system. Much of the associated machinery was replaced or adjusted at this time, and this pipe had been installed during that refit. 
The pipe had a length of 4.6 feet or around 1.4 meters and a diameter of 9.8 inches, which is 250 millimeters. This made it difficult to clean and visually examine from the inside. Corrosion had consumed an internal weld, allowing seawater to get into the crevice between the pipe and its flange. This led to aggressive corrosion that ultimately perforated the pipe from the inside out. The official report praised the quick thinking and professionalism of the ship's engineers. Their ingenious use of spare parts and their determination prevented a minor emergency from becoming a catastrophic event. The investigation highlighted that while the pipe had been surveyed just two and a half years earlier, the ultrasonic tests typically used could not detect the hidden corrosion in this specific area. As a result, the report made several recommendations, including at the next reasonable opportunity, a detailed condition examination of this type of seawater inlet in any compartment of QE2 whose flooding would seriously degrade the vessel's safety. It also recommended that Cunard Line, QE2's owners, ensure that its management is satisfied that any condition report made by technical staff on safety critical equipment is properly considered, and employ the results of the required detailed examination of these inlet pipes to mend the vessel's safety management systems to ensure the items are thoroughly and routinely inspected to ensure that their condition is met. Furthermore, the Lloyd's Register of Shipping, QE2's classification agency, recommended that the case be brought to the attention of the working party presently undertaking a review of engine room flooding incidents, with a view to offering standards against which they can assess the condition of safety critical seawater pipes. This video was brought to you by me and my new book, The Evolution of the Passenger Ship. In The Evolution of the Passenger Ship, we bring years of research together to create a book that takes you on a journey from the dawn of passenger shipping right the way through to the modern cruise behemoths that we see today. And if you purchase a copy, you support us, which helps us keep the channel going. Thanks so much, and now back to the video. The official report praised the quick thinking and professionalism of the ship's engineers. It serves as a great reminder of the skills and resourcefulness of those who work at sea, quietly ensuring the safety of thousands of passengers every single day. Thanks so much for watching, and I hope you found this video interesting. If you'd like to see more ship history and cruise content, make sure you subscribe. A huge thank you as always to our fantastic channel members and super thanks contributors. Your support is what makes these videos possible. You can join the crew and see your name appear in future videos by following the links in the description below. For even more interesting maritime history, don't forget to check out my Substack, full of exclusive articles about ships and shipping. Thanks once again for watching, and until next time, I hope to see you on board.